Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. And welcome to episode 377 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hi, Sarah. We are coming to you in August, friends. And today we're talking about things we're glad we did, or maybe that we wish we'd done differently, all related to back to school. So if you're maybe new around here or just new to this series, um, this is something we've been doing. Uh, it's the third time we've done it. We did Glad I Did, Wish I'd Done around summer planning and also around tech and devices. And it's kind of a fun little construct that allows both of us, Megan, to look back at especially parenting the little kid years and just be really gentle with ourselves. of like, oh, that worked really well. Like high five former me, like (laughs) young mom, Sarah, but also like in retrospect, I'm not sure I would have worried so much about this, or I'm not sure like I would have you know, done X, Y, Z, maybe a little differently in hindsight. So it's, it's, I I think these are really fun. Do you ever have a moment where you're doing one of these and you honestly get stuck? Like you're like, is it a glad I did? Or is it a wish I'd done? Like I, cause yeah. sometimes I'll look at something and say, I think I'm glad I did it that way. However, I'm also open to the idea that doing it a different way might've made my life a little easier or might've like headed off problems in the end or whatever. So it's, it's always, it's definitely not like um, prescriptive or black right. and white or like we're saying this is the way to do it. And that isn't I think it's actually very nuanced because there's always like a good and a bad side to any choice you make. I think it. I think you're exactly right. And of course, like I in coming up with this episode structure, it's like forcing something into a binary that, of course, isn't. But I think what you're describing is like the self-compassion that we all want to have. Right. It's like, oh, I did that. I, I had one. And I'll mention it when we get a little later where I was going to say it was a wish I'd done. And then I was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think I would have done that differently, but I can really see the benefits to doing it that way. So yes, it does. It invites a little, um, I don't know, like introspection for sure. Um, And we're talking about back to school. And I just want to acknowledge that like all over the country, people go back as early as early August, or we even have some like modified year round um, team members on our team who are already back in late July and then all the way through you guys, Megan, which is what, like after Labor Day? Yeah, I think it's September 6th this year. So yeah. listen to me. I don't even know the date, but it's whatever the day after Labor Day is. Um, I do think this will be the last year that our school district is going to hold on. Like they've held on like really long to that. And I think it'll probably be earlier next year, but not probably that much earlier. I'm going to say yeah. a week earlier. Yeah. yeah. We are um, August 24th is a start date for our local public elementary school. And then my middle schoolers have like a bunch of orientations. They have a very gradual start, put it that way. They are not in full academic schedule until after Labor Day like yours. So we're, we're on the slightly later end over here too. Just acknowledging that like this time of year with podcast content, it's always like, we know it's very summery for some of you, but it's also a lot of you are hungry for at least, um, the conversation around what this next big school transition season looks like. So we're just wherever you are, wherever you are, we're there with you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, we're like talking about back to school today, but in our actual real lives, it does not quite feel that way. It's not a thing yet. I have to ask you, Sarah. So the the 24th, is that like a Thursday? I think it's a Wednesday. How do you feel about a midweek start like that? Okay. I have have like really strong opinions about this. So (laughs) we've, we've been at schools for a long time because they don't start after Labor Day. If you're doing after Labor Day, you're going to start on a Tuesday, most likely. Um, and then if you're starting before Labor Day, the, the world is your oyster. You can do a Monday start. You can do a midweek start. And over the years, we've been at several different schools and I've had everything. I've had everything from a Monday start to a Thursday start. I don't think I've ever been at a school that starts on a Friday. Um, I get it. I think a lot of times they bring teachers back Monday, Tuesday, and then start Wednesday, or they want to, they just don't, they want kids to have a shorter week to ease in because it's a lot, especially in the lower grades. I will say, I think a Thursday start is dumb. I don't, I cannot get behind it. It feels like I'd be annoyed almost. Especially because they'll do like a half day. They'll do a half day the first day. And it's like, there's no school. And then you have a weekend and it's almost like then starting all over again the next week. So I'm a no go on a Thursday start. Um, I think a Tuesday or Wednesday actually does make a little bit of sense. The other thing is if you were trying to like 
maybe get a few extra vacation days in or take an extra trip. You can't do anything else that week. Like it's the week right. is, is a school week. The week so is shot. Now it's a school week. week. Yeah. That exactly. would be what would bother me. So yeah. I'm going to be team Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't mind a Wednesday because three full days is a lot, especially for younger elementary school kids. It's like, okay, we, we did that. Now let's take a couple of days of a breather and get and like hit it hard on Monday. So I'm okay yeah. with Tuesday or Wednesday. I am not okay. And I have had Thursday starts. And I've also had a couple of Monday starts and those are brutal. If you're putting five and six and seven year olds in full day, five days with no ramp up, um, it's, it, it's rough. It's a long first week. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't believe I've ever had a Monday start, um, because we've lived in Michigan all but one year of having kids going back to school. I will, when we lived in Chicago, we may have had a Monday or like a Thursday or something. We've always, always, always so in Michigan had a Tuesday start. So yeah. that's all I've ever known. And I think it's kind of perfect. Yeah, like, I think it is. It's too. not a full week, but it's, you just had a nice long weekend and then you have an almost full week, but not a totally full yeah. week. So I like yeah. it. I think Tuesday yeah. or Wednesday works well. And we're well, the 24th is a Wednesday this year. So Sarah, we have been having so much fun lately in our Instagram subscriber community. You may have seen these popping up in your IG feed lately and wonder what it's all about. Well, basically it's just another way to connect with us. Subscribing is a great option for listeners who are avid Instagram users or maybe who just like consuming bonus content. We've been doing a special monthly bonus episode on IG Live, which is so fun because Instagram is so visual, so we can actually show off some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, Megan. And one of the most fun things is we can actually open up a little group chat right after the live episode so subscribers can talk to each other and we can interact too. We've got people sharing their own photos and asking each other questions, which is really fun. If you want to join us in our Instagram subscriber community, it's really easy. Just head to the Mom Hours profile on Instagram. We're at the Mom Hour, and you'll see a subscribe button right there. Hopefully, we'll see you over there soon. Megan, we love hearing from our listeners who say they feel like they know us and we're their friends because the sentiment really does go both ways. And for our friends who want to share their love for the show, we have a shop. Yes, it's true. If you go to themomhour.com and click on shop in the top bar, you'll find shirts, mugs, and even the cutest little onesies for sale. And we know that some of you got or gave the Mom Hour merch at the holidays. So if you do own any of our gear, we would love to see a picture of you. Go ahead and post a picture on social media and tag us in it. We'd love it. Oh yeah, that would be so fun to see. And I love thinking of us all over the country and the world drinking out of our Mom Hour mugs. So again, you can find that link right on the homepage of our website at themomhour.com or go directly to themomhour.com slash shop. Okay, Sarah, can't wait to like pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Um, what, what do you have for a glad you did? Well, this is a glad I did arbitrary rule. You know, around here, how much we love our arbitrary rules. And um, that's just where you decide that something is the way it is in your house. Um, and then you stick with it and and the kids kind of just get used to it. And that's just how things are done in your house. Sometimes it's important for arbitrary rules to evolve, but this is actually one in my house that hasn't. And I went back and counted and it's been like over a decade. So I am glad that I created an arbitrary rule that my kids get a new backpack and lunchbox every other year, every two years. It's now been 11 years since my first child became a preschooler and got a little backpack. And I think we have done this every two years um, rule. I don't think we've wavered from it ever. And they really look forward to it. This was a year when everyone got to pick out something new. Um, They're going into ninth, seventh and fourth grades. And for the most part, the ones we've purchased, usually Pottery Barn. And um, I know a lot of people do Land's End. And there's a few like of the higher quality ones that will really last you at least two years. In fact, this is not a plug for our particular backpack. It's more a plug for making an arbitrary rule. But the backpacks we've gotten, the kids, they'll keep their older backpacks and use them as overnight bags. Um, Mm. And nobody's had a thing where it's like, oh, man, I really liked race cars and now I don't. And I wish I had like minions on my backpack. We we do kind of steer away from like really super fad, um, like licensed character stuff that tends to be a flash in the pan. But, you know, sometimes they've had something on their puppies or whatever on their backpack that they kind of like outgrew, but they outgrew it over two years. Two years was like the perfect uh, sequence. And it's really fun when it's a year that they get to shop and order. And it makes me feel good about spending a little bit more on a high quality uh, backpack and lunchbox. I am totally team like not um, 
buying a new one every year. I don't know that I was as like specific every other year, but I think it worked out to like every two to three years, depending if you needed one or not. And buying from Lansend really helped with that. Clara had the cutest like pink cheetah one that she used. It was so like non trend. It was, it was kind of like, it was an animal print. So it was a little bit trendy, but she really could have worn that for her whole, she could have used that same backpack like through now. And it's still, she still does for overnights and things like that. And it's in, it's in great shape. I have to ask you, did it just work out that it was all three kids at the same time? Or did you do that intentionally too? You know, I, I don't know if the pandemic like did a reset. It's possible the pandemic, like that one of the kids was off by a year and the pandemic yeah. like reset everybody. Cause we like missed so much school. Um, but my older two are two grades apart. So that kind of would have lined up, but then there are three grades between Reed and Violet. And I honestly don't remember. So it's, mm. it's possible that they didn't used to all be the same year. I just know that, um, this year, they all they all had gone two years without getting something new. So something about yeah. that, the timing of our move here, or I don't know, it's possible somebody like truly there's broke or something. And right. we, ju- we, yeah. we like made one exception or something like that. But yeah. right now they're all on the same schedule. Well, I could see a I could see an argument from doing it either way, like yeah, either totally. keeping it simple and keeping everyone on the same or making it feel really special for one kid and breaking like and spreading out the budget a little exactly. bit by doing it the other way. So I think either way it works. And I will tell you, kids can remember if they use their, this is not one of those things where you're like, shoot, now I can't remember. Like they'll know if, did they, did you use this backpack for first grade or kinder and first? Like they'll know. Yeah. Well, my first one is, um, also stuff related and that's actually kind of two in one. So the first thing, and this is kind of jokey is that I used to, I, I don't remember when I started doing this. Um, I have a lot less control over the kids backpacks at all now, but like this was an elementary school thing. And I feel like I started doing this when I had three or four kids in elementary school and that last day of school when they all came home and threw their backpacks on the floor. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I just, that year, whatever year it was, I thought I can't deal with this today. So I put their backpacks in the front foyer and then I just forgot. And I left them there all summer. (laughs) <laughs> and it was actually fantastic because then when I, well, actually the first year it wasn't cause I accidentally left a peanut butter sandwich in one of them. And that was kind of gross, That'll but happen. it could have been once. way worse. <laughs> it could have been worse, but it was kind of great because then when I thought, okay, well, I got to do back to school shopping. I thought, oh no, I haven't even gone through their old stuff. So I went and got it all out. And first of all, it was really fun because I was back in back to school mode by that point. Yeah. So I felt much more patient to sit down and like look through their notebooks. And like, yeah. I was just more in that stage. I wasn't over it yet. Mm-hmm. And also I was like, Hey, I think I could tear a couple of these pages out of this notebook and it gets reused. And this folder looks barely touched. And look, there's all these pencils that are already in this backpack. And I felt like it made me not rebuy stuff. It's not, I didn't have to have like a complicated organizing system for the stuff from last year. It just stayed in the backpacks till I was ready to do shopping for the coming year. So I love that. That was really nice. And then I just started kind of defaulting to that after that. And that was really fun. Um, and then along with that, I'm just glad I didn't stress out too much. And we've talked about this a lot on the show about having all of the school stuff bought by the first day. Most of the time you don't need everything on day one. And particularly when you're shopping for multiple kids at once, Um, or you've got kids in multiple grades or multiple schools, sometimes like certain grades will need everything by the end of the first week. And some don't need everything until a couple weeks in. And like, it just, it, I feel like when you can kind of ease in a little bit, um, it allows you to just shop in a way that makes more sense for you and avoid some of that rush that used to stress me out. So, um, yeah. And it always worked fine. I've never had a kid who came home the first day and was like, but mom, I didn't have my, you know, my sharpened pencils yet. And the teacher yelled at me like, that's never happened. It's, it never, ever happens. And in fact, like if you can remind your, if you're someone who does stress out about those kinds of deadlines or, or takes them as gospel, remember that there, there is always room for a family or two in the class who like just got back from a vacation or maybe who doesn't, um, English isn't their primary language. And they're like, not even um, able to sort through the list without some like help from the teacher. Like there, there's no, there's no world in which every single kid is showing up with those target bags full of the exact right stuff on the first day. And I, I'm saying that I'm preaching to my former choir because it's taken me years to realize like, oh yeah, there's built in buffer is what I'm trying to say. There's built in 
uh, allowances for you to take a week or so to get that or a month. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of our stuff on our school supply list is actually classroom donations and yeah. they're not using all of the hand sanitizer exactly. on the first day. They're using it throughout the year. And actually I think it can be kind of nice for that stuff to flow in as it's needed. And maybe that gives you a breather. Like when you're trying to walk into the school with like laden down with bags of that stuff, plus you're helping your kid and holding a hand yeah. and all that. It's kind of hard to bring enough, like as much of it as you might otherwise do, if you could yeah. just drop it off a couple weeks in when you're running out and, you know, running errands by yourself or something. So I think there's actually some benefits to putting it off. I agree. And I know teachers pretty well now. And I know that if there is something that's just really important to have by like the first or second day, um, it's often for your child's like emotional well-being. So having like I've had uh, teachers write ahead and have them bring headphones, for example, because they're going to be doing some assessment in the first week or something. So they will let you know if there's something that is really like each kid really needs to have this. They'll let you know. They'll find they'll track you yeah. down. So, yeah, yeah, I love that. I also love the the leaving the stuff in the backpack because I'm thinking about summer flies by. It's 10 weeks. Yeah. And why, it doesn't make sense to make like a summer holding area for all that stuff. I mean, the backpacks are the summer holding area. So right. That's, that. they become the organization system and exactly. then you just take care of it instead of doing it all once and then doing it all again. You just do it once. Yeah. Hold it and do it at the end. Yeah. Super smart. Okay. Well, this is especially for, I would say like preschool and younger elementary school years. I'm really glad that I, I'm going to use the word prioritized and not like obsessed over or overachieved at, but I really took my time with those, like, tell me about your child forms that often come home from the teacher. And it's not always the first day, but sometime in the first week, they usually send some kind of form or letter or email home saying like, Oh, answer these questions about your child. How do they learn best? What are, what's going on in the home? And I just, I really I really took those assignments quite seriously in those years. I took time with them. I wrote a lot about my kids and I almost felt a little like embarrassed or sheepish to be so extra about it. But I actually think it really helped calm my nerves as a newer school parent to have a place, a container to tell that teacher all those little special snowflake things that I wanted to tell them about my kid. Um, I didn't want to bother them with that information, like in the hallway at school, but it so I just like unleashed it. And a couple of times I had teachers say like, wow, like you really like, you really, you know, shared you really a lot. really got an A on you this really, assignment. I know. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed right now. But I, I think most teachers um, really do care and want that sort of idiosyncratic information about your kid that like when they're hungry, they get extra like tearful. They might, you know, they might cry at this time of day. And again, I'm really talking about the pretty little kids yet who have it, don't have a lot of skills at advocating for themselves yet. Um, or like getting to know a teacher on their own terms by, by second grade or so. I think teachers are really good at getting to know kids and, um, it's time for kids to be able to self-advocate and stuff. But in those little years, I really was extra about those. Tell me about your child forms. And I'm glad I was, I think it was a way it was like a coping mechanism for my own anxiety. And I do think it, you know, it helped, hopefully it helped the teachers. Well, I, I have to say, this is so funny that I have a similar, but different memory, but was when my kids were older, I bet those forms that came home when my kids were really little, I bet I didn't write very much on them. Cause I probably like you felt sheepish about sharing. Like, yeah, like they get teary when, you know, you'd, they lose their blankie or whatever it is. Right. And I think I would have been, I would have felt maybe a little awkward about that, but when they got older, I remember that being a middle school thing, uh, oh, several different teachers did. And then of course, because all my kids went through the same middle school, I had the same, and they often had the same teachers. I would do those multiple times. And I actually remember feeling like it was really important for me when I had a kid who was maybe 11 or 12 and maybe quiet or mm -hmm wouldn't show, always show their best selves. Like just knowing it, how kids can be at that age. It was just really important for me to have the yeah. teacher know yeah. like how cool my kid was. And I don't mean that in a, like, you know, again, like you're saying an extra special snowflake kind of way, but just like, Hey, this is who my kid really is. This yeah. is what I see in them. Um, and I want you to see it too. It was like a little, just like a little essay. 
yeah. I would write about my kids and I loved doing it. It actually made me feel really like warm fuzzy about my own child. It kind of put me in a good headspace about them, I guess. And so I did the same thing just when they were older. Well, you're making me think that uh, about the age range now. And I guess it isn't just when they're really little. Maybe that's my memory of feeling more anxious about it. But mm. actually, when we first moved up here to Santa Barbara, Reed was going into fifth grade. And I remember being very extra and he was 10 and it was mid pandemic and we were at a new school. Yeah. And I, that was one of the teachers who wrote back and was like, wow, thank you so much. And I was like, OK, I know that was a little extra. Um, and here's a wish I'd done built into this. Glad I did. I wish I'd somehow kept copies of those because I wrote mm. really thoughtful things about my kids at different ages. It would have been like a, you know, like a little time capsule, a little blog post yeah. almost, but I have no, mm. no way of, uh, and they probably I, didn't hang on to them. No, no, <laughs> nope. <laughs> the teacher didn't like take it and put it in her scrapbook. There was nope. this kid. The mom <laughs> this wrote me mom. this, <laughs> this mom wrote me a memoir about her child and it turned out to all be true. <laughs> all right. It oh, is your boy. turn. Yeah. Well, the, this one I've got, I've got a divorce related wish. Glad I did and wish I'd done. Um, and I guess just to give you a little like context around this, when the very first back to school that I had after separation during the divorce, where I was no longer in the same household with my ex. And so it was truly like separate households was 2017. So this will be the sixth, I believe back to school since. Okay. And, um, it really like at the time, I think I just wanted to keep things sort of like I was very um, motivated by like keeping a routine, keeping things as similar or as close to the same as they had been as I could for the kids. And yeah. so that has like its good sides and its bad sides. So I'm going to talk about the good side now and then I'll talk about the not so good side in the um, in the second half. But I think sometimes it's hard to know those things until you look back later with like a little bit of hindsight. Yeah which of those things turned out to be like, which of those things you put so much importance on actually mattered and which ones maybe didn't matter. Um, and, or maybe actually ended up creating more work for you because I know like in an early divorce or separation situation, this is pretty common for myself. And I know for other parents, like you just want everything to be smooth. Like you want yeah. them to not have disruption and upheaval. And so you'll jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that happens. And then sometimes you kind of get like stuck in that mode and then you huh? forget that three years in, it doesn't matter as much anymore. Right. Like you so can true. make little changes. Yeah. It's going to be okay. So the one I was glad of purely for selfish reasons is that I did manage to line it up so that I had the kids on the first day of school every year since separating. Um, it just kind of worked out that way because of the way we arranged our weeks. And so I didn't like work really hard to make that happen or anything like that. But it did. And I think that since my home was the one that was in the school district and was more of the primary home um, for the kids, it's like where most of their stuff was and things like that. I think it just made everything smoother and I had less anxiety. And I'm not like a controlling person necessarily, but I do like everyone to be comfortable. Like I get, I get kind of worked up thinking that my kids won't have what they need or yeah, yeah. Um, like won't have the the supplies or like, where are the thing, you know, like are, do they have what they need to feel comfortable on the first day? Do they have their outfits that, um, that they really want to wear on the first day? Like it just all, are they going to be on time on the first day? Like a lot of things that I would just, that just were important to me. I was able to have a little more control over yeah. for those first five years. Now yeah. this year, the kids will be with their dad on the first day because he's got them for labor day. And then instead of having them come home that night on Labor Day day, I was just like, well, just take them to school the next day and, you know, it'll be fine. And so I'll have them for the rest of the week and they're all very capable. They've been capable for a long time yeah. of managing their own first day outfits and school supplies and all of that. So I know it didn't have to be that way for five years, but I am kind of glad it was. I think it just made my experience selfishly. It also meant, meant I got to be the first day of school mom, which is like the most fun day of the year. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I really like that. And I like, um, I really like your thoughts on the way that evolves. I think that's so true yeah. in non-divorced families as well that, you know, eventually you're like, oh, this is maybe not, doesn't need to be held on to quite so tightly. There was a reason. Yeah. And now that reason is different. Um, well, here's one about homework in the lower grades, which is one of the things I have some opinions about as a mom. Um, if you've been listening a long time, you've heard me talk about it. 
Uh, but I here's what I'm glad I did. I'm glad I found a way as each of my kid worked their way through about K through second grade, kinder first, second to kind of communicate with my kids, teachers about my questions about homework and what I felt our family was doing at home to support home learning and like went into the conversation openly, but also in a way that like stuck with what I, I, they were pretty strong feelings about homework um, in those years. And across the board, I had really interesting and I would say like positive conversations with teachers And if I hadn't, if I had just said, well, this school assigns a lot of homework or this teacher doesn't assign a lot of homework and therefore I'm glad about that. And if I had just gone with what was, I guess, sent home in like the first week folder, I might not have learned as much about parent teacher communication, about advocating for like what felt important to me about letting some things go. Um, So it was a really good I guess, growth experience for me. And um, if you're not familiar or haven't heard me talk about it, I pretty much told teachers in the lower grades that our family didn't prioritize homework. It wasn't going to, it wasn't that I wasn't going to allow my kid to do their homework that of course, like we have sharp pencils and we have like time to work on stuff. But as a mom, I was not going to police or ensure that homework got done in the lower grades. And across the board, every single teacher said, That's absolutely fine. Thank you for sharing what you do do. And what we already did was we were already reading as a family and we were already, you know, outside in nature as a family. And I would list the things that we were doing anyway that I thought were important. And then the things I wouldn't be doing, which is forcing a first grader to complete worksheets. And every single teacher was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like some parents like the Mm -hmm. worksheets because it helps them know where their kid is. And, and I would always say if my kid's behind or if we need to revisit this policy, absolutely. Like I don't, I, I, I try to go in sort of flexibly, but also explaining like, here's what and why. And the whole thing now I'm all the way through those grades. Now, all of my kids are old enough to have homework, to take on their own homework responsibility. Um, and I, and I support it. And sometimes I even make them do it. So it's not like, It's not like I, it was a, it was a phase of life of about K through two and looking back, I'm, I'm proud of the way I handled it. Well, and I think it's, that's so like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a testament to having that communication and like just letting them know what's up. Because a lot of times if the kids aren't turning in homework, a teacher may think if you didn't, you know, communicate that the teacher might think it's because they don't get a chance to at home or because they don't have what they need at home or because like something like something else might be going on. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't told them this is what's happening and this is a family choice and like a proactive decision, then then that gives them the information they need to go. Oh, okay, cool. I don't have to worry about it then. Because I don't think most teachers don't like relish giving and, you know, um, checking first graders homework. I don't think that's like a huge priority for most teachers. It's part of Sometimes it's part of the expectations of the parent. Sometimes it's part of the expectations of the school. So they're like checking off a list, but I just think telling them is very smart. Yeah. And it it also opened up good conversations about the role that homework played in the classroom. I think sometimes we parents think um, that it's like a bigger deal, like the homework that that comes home then translates to the lesson they're doing the next day or somehow like I, I wouldn't want my kid to be like, the only one who didn't do something and now it's affecting the classroom discussion or now it's like my kid feels left out because they're the one without a folder. It did open up discussions around that. And at least in our schools and with our teachers, the homework was a pretty like it was for home. So like it wasn't it wasn't really then affecting any classroom dynamics either for my kid or for the group that I, I wouldn't have wanted. They didn't like, have to get up the next day and show it. <laughs> the, exactly. Well, exactly. Like, oh. That's exactly right. And often yeah. with project-based homework, of course, like if the homework was to bring in something red um, for the rainbow day, like it wasn't like, I'm like, no, we're not doing that. I'm talking about weekly packet homework, which I think a lot of, a lot of, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that I stuck with that. And now, um, now we do a lot of homework in this house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of time There's for time. that, right? That if, you, is, that... if you have little kids and you're like bumming, cause they don't have as much homework as you would like, believe me one day they will. 
Right. And that that is actually yeah. like that is probably my thesis statement about homework for those lower grades is like we got there's plenty of time. There's plenty of time for that kind of homework. So, yeah. How about you? Well, um, this is kind of a funny one because I feel like in the last several years, it's become like a meme almost. And I feel like maybe Jen Hatmaker had a post that went really viral about not scheduling anything. Mm, uh, like she any special does, things. Like, a lot, she has a lot I of feel, funny school related content. Yeah. And I feel like she brings something back year after year. Like it's been on my radar for the last three or four, maybe five years where it's like, here's what you don't do. Like you don't <laughs> like at the end of the school week, you, the first week of school, do not have a pizza party. Do not yeah. like, just don't do it. And I remember looking at that for the first time. So probably like five years ago, I'm thinking people are doing that. <laughs> so I just by default accidentally never scheduled anything special. No, like back to school parties, no back to school celebration, like nothing that would create an expectation for myself, which isn't to say sometimes we would end up going over to my brother's and having like a little barbecue on the Friday night, um, mm -hmm. of the end of the first week of school. But usually it was like that day, Jenna and I would be like, Hey, do you want to hang out tonight? And sometimes she's a teacher. Sometimes she's like, no, I have no energy. And I'd be yeah. like, cool. Okay. Me neither. Or sometimes it'd be like, yes, but let's do it right after school and keep it super short. It was very much in the moment. And I never had anything on the calendar that I would later regret. Yeah. <laughs> and I did not do that purposely. I just did that because it's kind of my personality to not really lock myself into a lot of things where I have to do a lot of planning, I guess. I don't really know how else to put that. It's not like I never plan parties, but it's, I don't have a lot of like, this is a special thing. I always do things planned like that yeah. are going to create an expectation around myself. Um, so it worked out great because we would just do whatever we had the mood and the energy for. Sometimes yeah. that was a, a walk. Sometimes it was a trip to the beach. If the weather was nice, sometimes it was literally nothing. And I'm really glad we kept it flexible. Yes. Um, love that. I didn't also to go the other direction, say we are absolutely not doing anything this weekend. We are going to like, sit around the house and recover. I didn't do that either. I yeah. was just like, Hey, whatever happens happens. And if some kids just want to hang out at home now that they're older and not do whatever the thing is, if something happens, that's fine too. Like we can all kind of make our own choices based on how we're feeling. So that was great. And then I also, as my kids got older, started to feel more free to actually skip the like school oriented stuff, which at first I didn't do. Like when they were in elementary school, I went to the ice cream socials and but I don't know that I went to every ice cream social for Clara. By the time I'd gone through it 15 times with the other kids, I'm not sure we went every single year. And, and our ice cream social would be the night that um, we would like pick up the, I don't know, that we you'd pick something up from the teacher. It was pretty like meet chill. Meet the teacher or find out your teacher. Meet the teacher. And then like something else would happen. I think maybe that's when you would drop off donations. I'm like starting to already lose track yeah. of what actually happened. Um but the ice cream was like an, a popsicle, as I recall, yeah. which to me does not qualify as ice cream. And <laughs> Call also me again it was like, when you have real ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was usually like the last week of summer vacation. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't really want to. So um, same with some of the um, middle school stuff that I'd been through five times by the time I got to Clara, I was like, do I need to sit through back to school night again? Right. I know all of these teachers now. All of my kids have had all of these teachers. I also know them personally. I know the routine. I know where you're yeah. supposed to pull up to drop the kids off. I, yeah. like, I know all this stuff. I just don't really need to go to that. And when I finally gave myself permission not to give up a Tuesday night, you know, during a really busy, because those usually are like the second week of school here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. to give up a busy Tuesday evening when I really just want to make dinner and get everybody settled and get them all kind of like on track. I just gave myself permission not to, and nothing bad happened and it felt fine. I, I, so. I feel like I'm midway on the trajectory you're describing. Cause I can definitely relate to like third kid, like, okay, what's absolutely necessary here? Like, do I have to right. do all, show up for all these things? But I am not quite there yet either because of my personality or just because I'm just not there yet. Plus we moved. So my, I'm still kind of right, new, you're in a to new this system. school. Yes. But like exactly. I, the, the idea of skipping actual back to school night makes me feel so anxious. In fact, I get anxious if they do the thing where they overlap grades and you have to like run from your second graders back to school night to your fifth graders so that like you can meet both teachers. I, for some reason I'm like, that makes me feel anxious. So I'm not, I'm well, not quite know there yet. You know how I finally realized I could do this was the year that I went and I had, I want to say, if not 
four than at least three elementary school kids. Yeah. So there was literally no way no. I could make it to every room. Like I couldn't. And I remember thinking, no one will know. No. Like, because I already didn't make it because well, there was no possible way to do it. You're not the first lady with four kids. Like there, right. there's, they, can't, what, they literally cannot expect you to be in two places at once. So, right. Right. Um, so it was yeah. kind of like, I go, wait a second. So if this whole time I've not been making it to all of them, what if I just went to none of them? Oh. What would that be like? And I couldn't do it in, in elementary school, like elementary. I'm pretty sure I made it to all the back to school nights, unless there was something like going on. Like I just had a baby or something yeah. like that. No, I never had a baby at the beginning of the school year. So yeah. maybe I was, heavily with, with child though. So it's possible I missed one, but middle school. Yeah. Yeah. I started missing back to school yeah. nights. That's it's all right. I love yeah. it. It all worked out. Megan today, we're talking about our partner minted, which is one of my favorite places to shop for gifts. I feel like people think of holiday cards and maybe framed photos when they think of minted, but it's actually a marketplace for independent artists who create all kinds of things, home decor, table linens, journals, and stationery, and original art. Well, I'm glad you reminded me of this, Sarah, because I think I'm guilty of forgetting to check back in with Minted to see what kind of new, unique home accents and gifts they might have. They have accent furniture, tabletop decor, and all kinds of art. When you shop their site, you get to learn all about the original artists and their backgrounds and stories, almost like shopping an incredibly well-curated craft fair, but online. And listeners, when you use our special link, you can help support the Mom Hour and an independent artist and a really incredible company all at the same time. Visit themomhour.com slash minted, a special page on our site where we've both picked some minted products we're eyeing right now, plus some great deals for you. Again, that's themomhour.com slash minted. Sarah, this isn't exactly breaking news, but I'm just going to say it. Comfy clothes are here to stay. Uh, yes. Okay. I am here for this. I mean, I was already on the cozy train even before COVID, but now I'm like, give me all the stretchy waistbands and soft fabrics but they still need to be cute, right? Well, obviously. And you're in luck, Sarah, because our partner Fabletics has the most stylish activewear. Seriously, I love their pretty colors, fun prints, and fashionable details. And right now we can get our listeners a fab list deal uh -huh, mm -hmm. of two bottoms for just $24 when they become VIP members. A VIP subscription is a great way to build that workout wardrobe or replace your worn out leggings with Fabletics best selling version. And you can always skip a month if it's not in your budget. Yeah, I love how flexible that is. And listeners, just click our special link from the show notes or head to themomhour.com slash fabletics to get that special deal. That's themomhour.com slash fabletics for fashionable activewear for everyone. Okay, Sarah. So the wish I'd done feel a little loaded because again, like we're not coming down on ourselves, right? No. These are just simple little things where it's like, maybe if I had done that, it might have made my life a little easier. So I will start with my divorce related one, um, which is kind of the inverse to the glad I did that I mentioned in the first half, which was that the way my schedule lined up, I just always happened to have the kids Mondays and Tuesdays into right. Wednesdays. So if there was ever a Monday or a Tuesday evening thing, um, daytime or evening thing by default, that was just mine. Mm -hmm. Worked out great for the back to school day. Didn't work out so great when I somehow very belatedly realized that literally everything happens on a Monday or a Tuesday. <laughs> like yeah. all of the assemblies that parents are supposed to go to, the concerts, um, the back to school nights, the social, like all of those things, not maybe not every 100%, but like 90% of those things happen on Mondays and especially Tuesdays. Tuesdays mm -hmm. seem to be a really big night for that kind of stuff in our district. So, because my ex works out of state, he works in it. He spends like half of his week, um, two hours away and then comes back and spends the rest of the week with the kids nearby. He was just not around and it would feel really dumb to be like, Hey, can you actually, I don't really feel like doing this thing tonight. Can you stand in for me? Um, and be the one that shows up to this event, like for him to drive back and forth and back and forth just didn't make sense. So it usually whatever assembly or event or meeting or whatever conference, whatever it was yeah. lined up with the day that we had the kids was usually how we would kind of divide it up. And I think that meant I had a lot more evenings I was spoken for. Yeah. Um, for school events, I perhaps didn't really want to go to. <laughs> so I maybe could have even reduced some of the guilt or feeling like I was the one skipping out on some of those things I mentioned in the first half. If, it hadn't been all on me to do it. And yeah. I think I could have gotten in front of that 
um, at the beginning of the year, I could have just looked at the calendar and said to him, Hey, I know usually I would take this, this, and this, but it, you know, that all falls on me this year. Mm-hmm. Could you take this one, this one, then this one, maybe that just means you'll keep the kids an extra day or whatever. And he would have done it. Yeah. He just would need me to like remind him or tell him that that was the deal and put it on the calendar. And I usually didn't because I would think, well, in the, I think it's no big deal. Like I'll just, right. I'll just do it. And then sometimes it feels kind of like a big, it's not a big deal one at a time, but when you look at the aggregate sure. of all the things that fall on your plate, then it is kind of a big deal. And, and so, the, yeah. And the invisible labor involved in yes. said assemblies, if we're talking about like getting the right outfit or signing an extra yes. form, like we, yeah, we yep. know how that goes. I, this is just like a, um, I'm uneducated about what a lot of divorced families do, but is there a, like, are there a couple typical ways that divorced parents divide up school related commitments or is it pretty typical that like whatever the primary custody, like who, like what you guys did, which is like whoever is in charge goes to the school thing if it falls on their day. I think it's very different depending on the circumstances, because if he and I had both lived, you know, within a few blocks of the school, so all things being equal, if we both had nine to five jobs in town and we lived close to the school, it wouldn't matter nearly as much who had the kids, which days right. Right. it would be a proximity thing. But the way we worked out our schedule was that it made it possible for him to not be here when he didn't have the kids. So it would make no sense at all for him to come back like right. that. Right. It wouldn't have made any sense. And I don't know if there's like a I mean, I know lots of divorced families where both parents show up for everything. Yeah. And I know divorced families where mom always shows up for everything and dad never does and vice versa. So I don't know that there's, Not I don't norm. know if there's a typical or like a best practice. I think it's very individual. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, here's a big one. This is probably my biggest one. And I think I'm still learning it. I'm still wishing I were a little different in this way. Um, I love back to school time. I love calendar planning. I love anticipating changes in seasons. Like I am your poster girl for like, okay, 14 more days of summer, like ordering the school supplies in advance. I remember when my kids wore uniforms when they were at a charter school and I would go to the uniform store, like because they, the sale would come out and they'd say, okay, like we're open these hours. We'd be going to the uniform store, Megan, at like July 28th. Like I was so for the following fall, I, it's fun for me to anticipate and to like nest. I feel like it's back to school Mm. nesting. What I think, what I wish I had done or noticed sooner is that What's fun for me is potentially <laughs> creating stress in, in more than one of my kids. My kids are all very different in the way that they absorb this anticipatory nesting energy in yeah. me. But I know for sure one of them, Reed, is um, he's not particularly like he doesn't have first day of school dread or anything, but he he doesn't need a lot of advance. Um, that's not true. Sometimes he needs a lot of advanced preparation, like to get off a video game or something, but it doesn't feel fun for him to talk about like what's going to the calendar plan and to like, uh, to build up excitement. I think it probably mm-hmm. just built up sort of vague anxiety or made him feel like summer was going too fast. Cause he also has that yeah. thing where like he has that like perceived loss of like, oh no, it's all slipping away so quickly that like loss of time. Um, so what I, what felt fun for me and admittedly probably starts way too early. I could tone this down even for myself and be like, okay, well it's still summer. Like, why don't you be in the moment a little bit more Sarah and not like be looking at school supplies at target on August 1st when you don't start till August 24th. So I wish I had, um, been more mindful that, my experience of back to school anticipation could be fun for me, but it didn't have to have to, or necessarily would transfer to my kids. Cause that just is a huge assumption that they are as excited about back to school as I am. When first of all, little kids have no concept of time, bigger kids might, but they might not be looking forward to it and that's okay with them. They may want to like be in the moment in the summer. So I think it's just a little bit of like a boundary issue of assuming that everyone in the house was as gung ho for back to school as, as I was. And then, you know, finally, just to put a bow on it, as it actually gets closer, like say when you're within a week or so, then I think, then I really could have had a lot of fun, like, okay, let's go do the beach one more time, or let's go pick out a new binder. It's just that I wanted that period of time to last for like 
four or five weeks. And I think my kids probably could have done with it lasting like a week. Well, you've still got plenty of back to schools to go. So how do you think you'll handle it this year? Because I feel like you, you know, and I know you and I kind of joke about this. Well, I feel like you very self-deprecatingly joke sometimes that you come to me all fired up about the calendar, like way before I'm ready Right. Like you want to talk about Christmas? You? Like, are you ready to <laughs> right. talk about Christmas? And sometimes here's the funny thing. If you caught me in the right mood, I might be all on board. But what would give me anxiety is like the assumption that there's a train that's leaving the station that I got to get on right now that I am not ready to board. That would be like, so there's a difference, right? Yes. There's like a difference between like, hey, I'm personally excited about this. And so I'm going to be over here like doing my thing. And if you want to join me, feel free. But if you don't, I'm not going to like infringe on your summer bubble with right. this thing. So I'm wondering if you're handling it differently this year or if you plan to yeah. as this season unfolds. Well, what I notice is that Violet is, she has my kind of bug. She loves to plan. She loves to anticipate. It's a double-edged sword because sometimes it drives me a little bonkers and I'm like, well, I created this monster. So right now I have one child who will just match me in fervor. And that is kind of fun. And then I just, I think I talk about it less. Um, we do have one big, like at a glance calendar from the essential calendar that I love. I'll link that up where the kids can see the whole summer at a glance. And so if they're curious when school starts, how many more days, Oh, which school starts first? Like, what are we doing the rest of summer? We, we do have conversations about that. I think I'm just bringing it up less, um, and like making it less a part of everyday conversation, you know, how many more yeah. days, like what's everybody right. excited for? Who do you think your teacher's going to be? I caught myself. Yeah, and they're like, mom, I don't it's care. Like, right, this is like not interesting to them. So it's interesting right. to me. It's not interesting to them. Yeah. Just, just yeah. being clear about that. So I, I actually think it's kind of interesting how both of us are using did was language when we very much still are in the thick of this and have yeah. Plenty. I still have five years of school to go, and you've got more than that. So, ten. yeah, um, ten. Yeah. So it's like we're still in it. And I guess if I could answer the same question for you, myself that I asked you to answer, am I doing it differently this year? Actually, we are actually going to change up our um, parenting schedule this okay. year, and wow. for the first time, we're we're going to go week on week off instead of the way we've done it, which is half week, half week. And it's going to mean a lot of changes. I think mostly for the better, but that's going to mean some you know, some expectations changing and yeah, it's, it's, I'm now used to having three or four days off every week and not missing my, but not also not ever missing my kids for more than a week. And now it's going to be like, so there's been times when I've had my kids longer in the summer, like I'll have them for a longer period of time. And by day five, I'm like, okay, who's going to come get these kids? Like (laughs) I'm, I'm waiting, like it's their time. And I'm like, oh no, I still have them for another three, four, five days because it just so happens John's on vacation or whatever. So it'll be like that, but life there's going to come, it's going to be like Wednesday night. And I'm going to be looking at my watch thinking, when is their dad showing up? Because it's my Wednesday where I want to like do a mask and have a glass of wine and just chill out by myself. And nope, it'll still be, I'm on until Sunday and then we'll switch. So, um, it'll just be, but then I'm going to have more time with them when I have it, which is also great. Like, it's great to have, um, seven full uninterrupted days. That feels, that feels nice too. So anyway, just saying like there's a, you can always change things. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, what about another wish you'd done? Yeah. So this is kind of a funny one, but I wish I had just planned from the get go, especially as my kids started getting older to get those first day of school pictures after school, or even like the night before when they had all their stuff laid out. Um, when they were little and like in elementary school, we just got in the habit of like taking a picture all together in the front yard on the way out the door Mm -hmm. to the car. It worked out really well because our, our elementary school here doesn't start until like, I think eight 25. So it was bright and it was great outside. Like it, it wasn't, it didn't feel rushed. We had plenty of time. The lighting was really good and we were all together. And then it started to fall apart when that first kid went off to middle school. Now they're getting up before dark. I'm dealing with the little kids while they're walking out the yeah. door. Like everything just changes. And I have now years where there's like pictures of like one kid eating their breakfast and uh-huh. like no other kids are in the picture or <laughs> what, like a dark picture of two blurry kids outside the, you know, the minivan or whatever. And then one kid's completely missing because they left for school 15 minutes ago. It just yeah. started to fall apart. And then I'd think, oh, maybe I'll grab another one after school. And I'd always forget. So I wish I had just said, you know, like put a note to myself 
that mm-hmm. let's just grab a picture of the first day. Well, let's commemorate the first day in some photographic way that does not have to literally be that morning. Yeah, it's it's stressful. Like the the first day pictures are are can be stressful because you're already trying to remember all the things and there's already right. kind of that frenetic energy in the house, let alone different schedules and like kids leaving at 615 or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's really smart. I wonder if anybody has thought of a really smart way to make that like a good repeatable ritual, but that doesn't add extra stress on kids or moms. I would be, I would be curious. Um, well, and it, couldn't it be any time? Like, I feel like, again, there's so much pressure around that first day, but yes. like, what about the night before I, we usually do something the night before the day before us is usually labor day. We're all together, like snap a picture or do it at the end of the week. Like, look, this was our, yeah, we made it we survived. to the first, end of the first week. I mean, there's lots of ways to do it that don't have to create that much more stress for yourself. And I just wish I'd thought of that a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really smart. Um, we, I have not. I've kind of let go of having all three kids photographed together since they've been at different schools. So I, I do still get a front porch picture of each individual kid or whoever's going off to the same school. But, um, after they weren't in the same school together, I think it's all separate. So, um, yeah, yeah. well, I'm going to talk a little more about calendar planning and (laughs) this is probably like a little (laughs) continuation of the thing I just said earlier, but actually when you were talking about not not scheduling, not holding too tightly to the back to school family calendar in either direction. Um, I was thinking about this one and this is that I wish I had sprinkled some late summer outdoor fun days through September, um, that allowed us to like almost have a blending of summer into fall versus what tends to happen is like all the marketing around you come post Labor Day is like fall everything. Like let's go apple picking and let's like wear our fall clothes and the climate still 87 degrees yeah. out. The climates yeah. <laughs> I have lived in are particularly brutal in fall. Um, but I know uh, lots of parts of the country, it's still quite warm through October. Um, and I think there's something about the flip over to school that makes me, it makes my mind different about things like going to the beach or going on like a day trip as a family. And the truth is there are plenty of opportunities in September for us as a family to be outside in nature and to, I don't know, like continue that leisure feeling of summer. And I feel like Megan, you wrote about this on your blog, maybe. Um, and you're always really like, like I I think you're, you're better than I am. And because of where you live seasonally about really taking advantage of whatever the actual weather has to offer. And I'm just going to come right out and say that our September is probably our hottest month here. It's way hotter. We have very cool summers until like August, September, October. So I think maybe this is instead of wish I'd done, it's more of like a a goal or, or intention for this year is not seeing the start of school as the end of um, things like beaches and barbecues, but actually seeing like, why can't we sprinkle some of those into September and October and have the existence of school and routine, but also like warm evenings and fun hikes and stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I get it that it's hard sometimes to switch modes. Yeah. Like the kids all just got home from school and now you're in, what does an after school evening look like versus a summer evening? Yeah. It's only three 30 or whatever. You still have a lot of time. Yeah. You have time before dinner. You've timed for an hour at the beach before you even yeah. have to think about dinner. Um, but it's like, but they're already wearing clothes. Yeah. <laughs> how will I go to the beach when they're all dressed for school? Well, you take it off and you put the swim trunks on. I mean, it's really not that big of a deal. So So, yes, but you have to be able to switch that mode and be a little bit flexible, which even for me sometimes can be hard when I'm like, but this is a glorious fall day. And it's, but it's like still it's 85 degrees out. And I'm thinking of it as like a fall after school day where I'm going to make stew. Like, no, that's not happening today. Let's just go with what the weather actually is. So I get it. I get it. Um, But it's, it's a great, I, when I'm able to like, let go of the idea of what an after school day should look like and can take Mm -hmm. advantage of the weather um, or whatever actually is happening temperately or temperaturely, Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy it. And it feels like a little bit like cheating, like Mm -hmm. you're getting extra time that you didn't have. So that feels good. Yeah. How about you? Um, well, (laughs) this is kind of one that might surprise you about me because I don't have a reputation for being that much of a planner, but 
As my kids moved into middle school and high school, I wish I had gotten in the habit of writing down each child's schedule, not going by anything that was given to me by the school, no printouts or handouts, nothing online, something I wrote down all in one place with Mm -hmm. the subject, the teacher's name and the teacher's email address, and then had put it like on my desk or in my inbox or something because I would rely a lot on the things that were given, like the syllabuses, and I'd have them kind of stacked up on my desk or like the Uh handouts you get at back to school night or, you know, the emails you get from the teachers. But what I found was happening was that multiple kids of mine went through the same schools. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of teacher overlap and a lot of similar named teachers. (laughs) And I would feel so dumb sometimes because I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, Owen right now has Mr. Catania for history. I'm like, oh no, that he teaches like seventh grade. So there's no way that's (laughs) Owen. Does anybody have that teacher right now? Hmm. What's going on? I would literally, I literally just blank out. Uh And then if I have to get in touch with the teacher, not only could I not remember who they are and that's really, even if I've met them and seen them recently, I just forget. Now my kids, when all of my kids were in school, there were like 20 teachers. It's too many. It's too many. It's too many. And and some of them teachers I'd had dealings with before, some of them new teachers. Um, some of them teachers that my kids literally never speak about. Uh-huh. I found that to be very interesting as they get into middle school and where they have multiple teachers. There will be some teachers your kids talk about all the time and some they don't ever mention for good or for bad. Like they yeah. just don't ever come up. And or some that you never really have any reason to get in touch with because the kid does just find that class and it's just not a thing. So anyway, every time I have to get in touch with one of my kids, teachers about basically anything right now, it's a whole thing. Like yeah. first I have to remember who the teacher even is. Then I have to go sift through the website to find their contact information or like yeah. a pile of papers on my desk. And I just, again, I wish I had, but I think I will mm-hmm. write that all down. I I'm like really, uh, attentively listening to this one because I'm about to have for the first time more than one kid in a multi-teacher situation. And so I can see so clearly how in the beginning you'd kind of know because it wasn't that many names to keep track of. And now it's 12 instead of six and then it's 18. And yes, it it just, it's like math. The the, the math is crazy. Untenable. It reminds me of, this is like a totally different area of parenting, but it reminds me of when my kids started getting wiggly teeth and losing their teeth. And, um, I, I would always know like which, which ones were wiggly or how many teeth a kid had lost. And I also have like slightly a dental background. So I was paying pretty close attention to their mouth. And there comes a point with multiple kids losing teeth where you're like, I don't know, like, have they lost all right. their baby teeth? Like, are they exactly is, yeah. like, are they, is that a permanent tooth or a grown up tooth? I don't know. Like there's too many teeth. That's 20 teeth times three kids or five kids. So it was really funny. The numbers just, the scale starts to get very untenable. It oh, does. Really- and then you start to lose a little bit of interest. It's not as right. novel anymore no, you're so either. Right. So you start to just not really care. And with the tooth thing, Clara went to the orthodontist a year ago and he said, well, you know, everything looks good, but let's just wait until your last molar molars come in or until you lose your last molar. Sorry. Yeah. We can't because of whatever. I know lots of times orthodontia starts earlier, but whatever they were going to do with her, they said no point starting yeah. now. We'll wait. And I just completely lost track. And I finally had to ask her, so are you still working? Like how many teeth do you have to lose? She's like, none mom. Don't you remember? And I said, no, I don't remember. Do you know how many teeth have been lost on my watch? Like so many, literally a hundred, isn't it? 20, a hundred teeth. I'm sorry. I missed number 99 and 100. It wasn't that momentous to me. So poor Clara. It's so funny. It's so funny. Reed just (laughs) lost his last baby tooth. So we're down to like, no, the older two are no longer losing teeth. And then I think Violet has whatever, eight more, 12 more or something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So funny. The little, that was a little sidetracking, but I'm really uh, motivated by this because I can see how this math would get real tricky. And like I said, I'm about to have my second kid in middle school. So very timely. Yeah. It gets well, real, real fast. <laughs> it gets real, real fast. Um, well, my last one, I think the last one we have for today, um, is this is just really simple, but I wish I'd realized sooner when I was a very new school parent, just how normal and human most teachers are. And it sounds silly to say it that way, but I think what happened when I was brand new to being a school parent, even in, I'm talking even preschool, like one, one kid in preschool, I kind of put teachers on this like big all knowing pedestal, um, which they are not, they're humans turns out. And it mm-hmm. had a couple of negative side effects. Uh, one it made me feel like 
teachers were so important that they must be very busy all the time. And like, I didn't want to bother them about things. I know I talked about writing a lot on the forms, but that I felt like because they had asked, I could, I could be extra. But if it was some little thing, I didn't feel like I was, my kids needs were like important enough to place a phone call or ask for a meeting. Like I would just never have done something like that because I thought, again, I kind of had them on a pedestal, but the other negative side effect of putting someone on a pedestal is it also like kind of made me feel like every teacher was either amazing and perfect and infallible, or if they did something I didn't like, or if I had kind of heard through the grapevine that they were terrible. And most teachers are neither infallible nor terrible, turns out, just like most humans, you know, so it was that it, it really, I think, impeded my ability to build good relationships in the early years with teachers or, or I I shouldn't say good relationships. I think I had good relationships, but I still had them on this kind of pedestal when, as I've moved through school and, um, I know you, you've always had good friends who are teachers. I didn't really have any good friends close to me who were also teachers. So it was like this, um, impenetrable world of teacherness. And once I penetrated that, once I got in and started to have some friends who were teachers or become genuinely friendly with some of my kids, teachers, cause multiple kids had them or like we end up following each other on social or something. I have so enjoyed really getting to know teachers and I'm so much less intimidated by them than I used to be. And I'm also able to be a little more nuanced, like, oh, you know, that teacher is like, she does a couple of things that I just am not crazy about, but I really like her as a person. Or like, I think overall, she's a really good educator. I'm not crazy about the way she thinks about this, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I've been able to have a much more um, whole and like realistic view of teachers and better relationships. So I just wish that I'd been less silly sooner. I, I do think it's very normal. Even yeah. as someone who has lots of teachers who are friends, that doesn't mean I feel on equal footing with teachers I don't know, or even teachers I do know who I perceive as being maybe a little judgy or yeah. like having perfect kids, you know what I mean? Like, or having really high expectations. I can still get in a position where I feel like I'm being judged or yeah. like not worthy, like not worthy yeah. to bring my um, peon questions to you. And I think when you put someone up on a pedestal, like you said, that power dynamic means that if they don't, if they do something that you don't like, you don't feel like you have any power in the relationship and it's like a toddler lashing out, then yeah. you're just mad. Like, yeah. Or you just decide right? they must be a terrible person and off. a terrible teacher. Right. Right. Exactly. So yeah, I think that's a great, like, that's a great thing to work toward if you still have that dynamic. And I definitely am somebody who has a hard time calling teachers by their first name. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're very special Smith people, to me. Yes. It's teachers and doctors, right? That were like, yeah. they just must know everything. Well, actually, right. I think our community has really helped me in this area too. We have so many teachers in our community and I always think it's really fun when they can weigh in on things as a mom and a teacher. And I think that's really like helped me just see the, the, the truth, which is teachers are humans yeah. too. Many of them are parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of that, before we wrap up for today, I wanted to let everybody know that I, um, on a whim last week collected all of our, um, kindergarten specific content onto one page, because I know that getting ready for kindergarten is a special type of anxiety all of its own. And we've done some episodes about it. We have some blog posts about it. And so I just called it the Kinder Parent Primer and collected all that in one easy page. And so I will link that up in the show notes if you or someone you know is approaching kinder um, or I would say any like of the early, early grades, but especially kindergarten, um, then check that out. And it's kind of like everything you need in one place on our site. So that was fun for me. All right. Well, it's going to be a whole week for, before you hear from us again. Um, next episode will come out next Tuesday and we're just going to do kind of a grab bag. Just chat about what's going on in our lives as we wrap up our summers. So we will talk to you then. Talk to you then. Bye.